Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my absolute pleasure to be here this afternoon. And it's so commendable and amazing to have this event here in our tiny and wonderful campus. So I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about myself, perhaps telling you, giving you some context about how I got here, uh, why perhaps I'm even on this stage. The earliest memory I have about food uh, probably goes back to the year 1976. And many of you, I'm sure, born at that time. Um, I was about 10 years old, and my family and I lived in a 700 square foot flat in Mumbai, in a suburb of Mumbai called Kalina. And one afternoon, I, through my own volition, discovered some money that didn't belong to me. It was a crisp 100 rupee note that I found in one of the closets underneath a whole bunch of clothes. It was clearly not mine. I was 10 years old. It was not my money. I couldn't help myself. I helped myself to that money. Okay? So I took this 100 rupee note and didn't even think about what I wanted to do with it. I went to the local markets, the local grocery stores, the food stands, and I ate my way through Kalina with 100 rupees. <laughs> I paid the price gastronomically the next day. But I had a great time. Unfortunately, that was discovered. My brother found out it was his money. He asked me what happened. I said, well, if you really must know, I ate it all. <laughs> that wasn't good enough. That wasn't an apology, clearly. My brother at the time actually was a professionally trained chef. So he held me literally by my ear for half of the way to the markets. The rest of it through with my hand made me go to every store where I had spent this money and made me personally apologize to everybody and tell them that the money that I used to buy their produce was not mine. That was the lesson that he wanted to give me, and I learned that lesson. So my first memory of food was pleasant as well as unpleasant at the same time. Long story short, fast forwarding, I, like many Indians around me, wanted to make a better life for myself. So I got on a plane in 1987, a Pan Am flight, and flew all the way across the United States, landed at JFK, missed the connecting flight, was put on a Greyhound bus, was sent all the way to Blacksburg, Virginia, through Roanoke, Virginia, in the middle of the night. A limousine came, picked me up, took me to where I needed to be, and all of a sudden I was in, gra I was in graduate school, studying mathematics. I had no assistantship. I came with $500 that my mother uh, loaned me to pay tuition for the first quarter, and that's all I had. So I found a job in the library, uh, making $200 a month, and tried to get by. Two weeks into my stay, my dear friend, who knew me at the time from India, took me to lunch in Blacksburg, Virginia. And it was, it was his treat. He'll me, I'll take you to lunch. Let's go. Sure, wonderful. So we go to lunch. We go to this wonderful place. I had never been to any place like it in my life. We walk into this restaurant, and he says, order whatever you want. And there's a display of food up there. He says, pick whatever you want. I have no idea. I don't even know what any of the words mean. So I let him pick for me. And he did. And we proceeded to have a wonderful lunch that I have even to this day remember. I remember the taste of that food. I really do. At the end of the meal, he proceeded to ask me, so how was it? You know, did you enjoy yourself? I said, of course, that was absolutely beautiful. It's the, one of the best things I've eaten in my life. I mean, it was French fries and something, a nice, beautiful sandwich, you know? It was loaded with what seemed like fresh ingredients. And um, he wanted more. He said, he's a foodie himself at the time. He said, what, what, what exactly did you like about that sandwich? I said, I don't know, but... I've never had anything like that thing in the middle, that brown little thing in the middle. I've never had that. That was delicious. He didn't even know what I was asking. Needless to say, I was asking about this thing in the middle, in a burger, right? So he said, what do you mean, that beef burger, that patty in the middle? I said, beef? I was a vegetarian. I was raised a vegetarian. I've never eaten any meat in my life, <laughs> let alone a burger. So nevertheless, I got psychologically ill. I went to the bathroom. I said my prayers. Uh, I, I swore I would never tell my mom because she would have been distraught. I had just consumed a Whopper with cheese. <laughs> and I had loved it. And I loved it. I still remember its taste. So my second memory about food was not so pleasant either. It was pleasant and then not so pleasant. Okay, so. Um, here I am, 
I'm a professional chef, I'm a mathematician, and I recently learned that I'm also a pick. My first use of the word global uh, was probably in the year 2001 on this very campus. September 11, 2001. All of you know that date. After the events of that date, there were a myriad of discussions on campuses just like this, all over the country, as you can imagine. And as a junior faculty member here, I remember engaging in all those kinds of discussions. And I had my two cents worth. I used a phrase like, I consider myself a global citizen, so let's put all this in perspective. I remember saying that. And some of my colleagues absolutely championed that and said, wonderful, that's a great way to think about all this. But I distinctly remember a former dean publicly admonishing me for using a, a phrase like that at a time like this. And in his, in his words, being a global citizen makes no sense. There's no such thing as global citizenship. For example, one can't really carry a passport that's global. And that was the argument. That because you can't have a passport that's global, global citizenship, for example, doesn't make sense. Today, I consider myself as much of a global citizen as I've ever been. So when I think of food, I think of food globally in terms of its ramifications around the world, in terms of the flavors that you can create with those ingredients that are drawn from around the world. Food does not come from a grocery store, as you well know. But a vast majority of people out there think that food comes from grocery stores. A head of broccoli comes from the back room of a grocery store. If you've ever been to a farm, you know that's not true. There are a variety of farms around us that celebrate the bounty of our region. Food doesn't come from a grocery store. Food comes from places like that. Yeah. We have wonderful farms around us. How many of you have been on a farm? How many of you have picked a vegetable from a farm and eaten it raw, right there and then? How many of you picked a vegetable right there from the farm and cooked it right there on the farm? How many of you have that experience provided to you by somebody who actually knows what they're doing? <laughs> so now can you imagine if, if a farmer celebrated his or her produce and showcased them by treating you, the guest, with a sense of their own faith in their product, right? So whether it be from a cultural point of view, that's what they grew up with, whether it be from a gastronomical point of view, maybe they're trained, a chef in training, what have you. So the kinds of things that chefs can do is truly unique. We are trusted to put inside your body ingredients that you don't even sometimes know anything about. But when you go out and dine, you've given yourself up, you've given your body up to us and say, here, I trust you. I trust that what you're going to put in my body will not hurt me. Can you imagine that kind of responsibility that a chef carries? That's what we do. We bear the burden of trying to nourish your bodies with the best possible ingredients. So we're in many ways uniquely positioned to advocate for food and food systems around the world. A, you trust us, and B, we know something about what we're talking about. We know the ingredients, we know the sources, ideally, right? We know what could be done with these ingredients. We know the story behind the ingredients. We know the farmer sometimes. We know what generation farmer this person was. We know how they got there. So when we put some food on the plate, we're not just preparing a bunch of ingredients and putting them on the plate. We're telling you a story. We're telling you a story about the ingredients, about the community, about the economy, about the health, about the sustainability, about the environment, about the climate, about the future, and ultimately about the taste that those ingredients can provide for you, the happiness that those ingredients bring you when they're prepared thoughtfully and globally. Right? So local food for global thought. That's the only way I know how to cook food. I used to go to the market every day. I would handpick the ingredients myself. As a young kid, when I would rather go out and play, I was asked to go to the market, bring the ingredients so my family could prepare the dinner. It's the only way I know ingredients. 
If I don't touch the ingredient, I don't know the ingredient. It can't be shipped to me. Ultimately, it has to be sometimes. But if I can go there, pick it myself, I have so much more to offer in terms of the end result than if it was just shipped to me. And that is, the, that is what I champion day in and day out. That is what chefs should be championing day in and day out, is to tell a story that's well beyond the flavor of the ingredients. To tell the story about where these ingredients come from and where the people who make these ingredients come from and what is their life like and what is their future going to be like. Because ultimately that affects all of us. We have no way around it. So when we host farm dinners at places like this, people seem happy. They're happy because they're near the ingredients. They know where their food comes from. It's not such a hard thing to ask. The next time you go to a grocery store, for example, ask the produce manager. This says fresh from Florida. Fresh from Florida corn. Fresh from Florida zucchinis. Fresh from Florida strawberry. Could you tell me more about exactly where is this fresh from Florida farm? There is no such thing as a fresh from Florida farm. It's a label. It's a food label that is trying to tell you this is from the state and it's fresh. If you've had fresh strawberries, you know that some of those things that are so-called fresh strawberries are nothing like fresh strawberries. Right? Strawberry season just ended, unfortunately. So when chefs out there say, we don't have strawberry pie today because strawberry season ran out yesterday, you as consumers should be cognizant that that's okay. You should be sympathetic with that idea. That should be okay. You shouldn't expect butternut squash year-round. You, know? you shouldn't expect butter lettuce year-round. You can get it for sure. But I can tell you, you have no idea where that ingredient came from, and it probably wasn't sustainably grown. That the negative ramifications of those types of ingredients that are so off-season and so non-regional is catastrophic in the long term. Having said that, the world's population is seeming, you know, it's, it's, it's stretching at the seams. So how on earth do we feed so many people in the way that I'm proposing? Right? It's next to impossible. All I can do as a chef is to practice what I preach. All you can do as a consumer is to practice what you believe. But now imagine this euphoria. Imagine this utopia, if you will, where everybody, maybe five generations from now, where none of us will see the outcome of our actions, will live that way. And whether or not they will realize when all this started. All this started when the Industrial Revolution started making food faster and faster, right? And here we are, some of us now, trying to slow that process down. So we're trying to go full circle in a way. But we're also scientists. We're thinkers. We're intellectuals. We understand the logistics of the problem. We're not naive. I'm not proposing a naive solution to a really complex problem that's, possibly, that, that's probably impossible to solve in our lifetime. But should that prevent us from trying to do the right thing? I mean, don't we have values? Why can't we live our values? That's what I ask you. So I'm a teacher at heart. Every chance I get, I shamelessly teach. In this instance, I'm teaching about cooking to the next generation of chefs at the Second Harvest Food Bank. Because these are individuals who are trying to make something of their lives, and they've found food as a source to do that. So if I can provide a little bit of something to them, I've not only taught them about food, which is the best part of it all, but I've tried to instill in them a value that can be sustainable. Because they are, after all, the future of how food is used and consumed in our world. You may recognize this campus. It's not far from where we are today. <laughs> We've done the exact same thing on our campus, on multiple locations. A camping stove, local ingredients, cook up a meal that tastes better than anything in a restaurant. And I cook really good food in our restaurant. But nothing that's made that way, uh, nothing that's made in a restaurant can top something that's made that way. That's an absolute fact. I can tell you that as a professional. It's the, it's the camaraderie of the event. It's the freshness of it all. It's right there. The flavor is right there. Another way that we can really promote what's going on is the use of celebrity. Here's a famous chef. 
when he says something, it's the gospel. So we should empower our celebrities and force our celebrities to say and do the right thing. Chefs like myself have wonderful opportunities like this. We get involved and get invited to boot camps. We go through a process. We discover ingredients like we've never before. We see the taking of a life in front of us. How many of you have, ex have you experienced that? How many of you have seen a living thing struggling for its life that will ultimately end up on your plate? It's poignant. It is stark. It's not pleasant. But it's reality. Ultimately, it's about the taste. If the food doesn't taste good, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. You can't preach about doing the right thing if you can't make the experience enjoyable. So here, for example, is that same dish that I served to that same celebrity, where 90% of the ingredients were local, but the main ingredient, which is that diver scallop, is from nowhere around here. And it can't be. So in the perfect world, I should have used bay scallops in season from Florida, as opposed to a diver scallop from New England. When you run a business, your hands are tied. You have to do that. So I can't preach to the masses and say, you've got to use only local ingredients. It makes no, that's not possible. All we can do is try to maximize what we do and do it in the best way possible. Here's an example where I was caught red-handed. This salmon cooked at a very famous place in North America at a very prestigious event by me, those are my fingers, is not sustainable. And my hand was caught in the cast iron skillet, so to speak. <laughs> and I was caught red-handed. I got a lot to learn. So ultimately, all of you have to find your own way of eating. You have to learn to think, you have to learn to think, you have to learn to question, you have to learn to advocate, but not necessarily be an activist. I am not an activist, but I'm an advocate. I practice what I preach. You can do as well. You can train yourselves, you can eat, you can educate, you can advocate, you can be an activist if that's what you want, but you continually have to train yourself. At the end of the day, we're all just trying to increase the kind of demand we'd like to see. Change, systemic change is impossible if the right kind of demand isn't there in the marketplace. That's the bottom line. That's the nuts and bolts. So we have a say in that. So whenever possible, avoid that brown stuff in the middle that you don't even know where it came from. And appreciate that strawberry in season. Thank you.